Well, welcome everybody to our Azure seminar our series. It's uh, so I'm Dave Schneider, the director of MS Studies for System Engineering. It's uh, my uh, distinctive honor to introduce our, our speaker for today, uh, Professor uh, Timothy Sands. He was a professor of practice at both the Naval Post Graduate School as well as Cornell University. Uh, he conducts research in the in application of adaptive learning and uh, adaptive and learning methods, particularly in defense related systems. Uh, he has actually over three decades uh, in military experience where he's held both executive and senior leadership positions in both the uh, military postgraduate universities, uh, which is the Naval Postgraduate School, as well as the Air Force Institute of Technology, where he has served as both associate dean, dean, associate provost, and chief, acad uh, chief academic officer sequentially there. So without uh, further ado, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to hear uh, Tim, Tim's uh, presentation here. Tim, we'll uh, give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I want to present today a topic. It is uh, something I touched on last year. I gave a colloquium for MAE in December, uh, and the topic was the same. There's just some slight differences. Uh, and so this is a little bit uh, tailored for a systems audience. Um, it is perhaps a term even that folks aren't familiar with or think it's anathema since AI is ubiquitously understood to be a stochastic kind of operation as opposed to a deterministic one. Uh, so we'll try to talk briefly about that. Uh, it, it, there is a difference between a deterministic algorithm and a stochastic AI context and what I'm gonna present today. So uh, uh, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I am still uh, teaching some little bit at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and, and the effort there is to tie uh, Cornell, uh, the Sibley School and the Systems Engineering Department uh, closer with defense research to the degree that folks are willing to do so, uh, that we'll be able to uh, have students from Cornell, from the Air Force and the Naval Postgraduate Schools uh, working on things together, uh, different aspects of problems without a great deal of formality needed since I might be teaching a very similar or, or the same course at both institutions at the same time. Uh, that makes it easier for me uh, to help with collaboration without having to try to um, establish formal agreements and pass money back and forth, which is always complicated. And then I just have to be mindful that uh, I can keep separate uh, what belongs to Cornell and what belongs to the U.S. government. With that, ta-da, a disclaimer, uh, nothing I say today uh, is on behalf of the U.S. government or anybody else other than me. Sorry to have to put it in there, but I am still uh, doing stuff with the military schools and they require this to make sure that you all know I'm not speaking on behalf of the military. I'm just a regular old dude. Uh, so the when I use the word system throughout today, you're going to see this DAI, deterministic artificial intelligence, applied to different kinds of systems. We'll concentrate today on motion mechanics. So those that are highlighted there in red, spacecraft, aircraft, underwater vehicles, things that obey the same governing physics. Uh, but it will equally apply to things like circuits, which I've just uh, uh, published this month or publishing, I guess I should say it's in typesetting now, a um, circuit learning algorithm to help it be um, robust to the deleterious effects of electromagnetic pulse. Uh, so it's, it's exactly the same method. It's not altered in any manner uh, to what I'm going to present to you today. It's not part of the presentation, but that's the latest. Uh, and then I've also already published some stuff about how it applies to esoteric stuff like average global temperatures and vehicle electric vehicle sales data and stuff like that. And that will seem much more familiar to you because it will lack the assertion of a physics-based uh, differential equation that governs the system. This was uh, last year, sort of a, a genesis of it. This was funded by the US Navy, the Office of Naval Research. Uh, they wanted me to try this method on underwater vehicles as depicted on the upper left. And the task would be, can it navigate around potentially a minefield, uh, simulated mines, of course, uh, but navigate around a minefield and not get hit. But then if it does get hit, can the vehicle of itself autonomously know that it's hit, update all of its math models in the, it's not really avionics if it's a submarine, but I hope maybe it is still avionics, but update them on the fly, learn the new situation that it's in, and continue to do its mission despite per perhaps significant battle damage. At the extreme end, uh, we, we're simulating the whole 
tail end gets blown off and you lose the propulsion system, can the vehicle know it? And then the vehicle know to potentially wave ride, for example, uh, to navigate its way around a, a potential minefield. Uh, so this is the genesis, genesis of the in-depth research of the method. But then we will, you'll see it quickly extrapolated. Last year, as I was doing this method, I was teaching a course in spacecraft attitude control at the Naval School. Uh, and we did it as part of that course, applying it to spacecraft. Uh, and you'll see a publication by those students at the time um, expressing uh, and manifesting the method as it applies to spacecraft. Uh, this is just, you gotta have cool videos. So this is me when I was a young lad. This is a spacecraft free floating simulator. So what you'll see there's air pipes or air hoses coming down here, here's some air gauges. This pedestal, uh, is, is heavy duty robust such that it holds air pressure. So there's a black ball right here where air is blown up around the ball. And this has a socket end fitting over the ball. This whole spacecraft simulator is sitting on top of that such that when you see me depress a foot switch down here, air is sent up the pedestal and this spacecraft simulator will free float on a very Thin, thin film of air. Uh, it is not completely frictionless, but it's pretty darn close. And it's a good uh, replication of spacecraft so that we could do three degrees of motion. We could roll, pitch, and yaw and maneuver in a free floating manner, even though we're on a ground in a lab. This is an example of what happens. Oops, let me get rid of that screen. There we go. Uh, the little video is an example of what happens when you're controlling a spacecraft. We don't have the math models right. In this case, we're going to strike a singularity right here where the actuators have a singularity in their position. So uh, knowing the equations well is really important if you're trying to fly around or through those singularities. That's the initial mathematical task. We're basically trying to basically trying to solve what's one over zero. And so that, of course, generates all the crazy motion about the spacecraft. Um, so that's going to make the focus of the talk shift to an emphasis on modeling and get, getting the models right. Uh, and what happens when we get them right is good. And when we get them wrong, this is one instantiation of what happens when we get them wrong. So when you get the models right, I'll show you two quick videos here. You can also make them adaptive or learning. So this would be now 10 years ago. Uh, when I was at DARPA, I came across this program, which was called a fault tolerant uh, control system for fly by wire fighters, F-15, F-18. Uh, what you'll see on the right, we just blew off the right wing and the right vertical stabilizer. And on the left, we've blown off 80% of a wing. And no one's, this is all completely computer controlled. The jet learns, oh my goodness, I've just lost a wing. You'll see a big dip down to the right and then watch how quickly it writes itself. When it's right, when it has righted itself, the aircraft knows what's happened, has changed its online math models in the avionics. And in this case is not learning, but it's adapting. It's just using adaptive, nonlinear adaptive techniques. And it comes back for a computerized landing without a pilot. And you can see on the left, I uh, had a little trouble there staying on the field. On the right, it's going to a slow playback now, 33% speed, 60% of a wing and a vertical stabilizer. And then we'll see it also fly around. Check out the angle it's coming in at. It's, we call it crabbing. It's dipping a wing and turning the nose and pulling it up slightly. The jet knows it's damaged and knows what attitude it needs to fly in in order to do that. So once it learns its new math model, it knows, oh, I don't have a wing over there. It uses what's left on the aircraft. Uh, and so uh, when we fly as pilots, we do that manually. We do things when the wind, if I'm flying at you and a wind is blowing me this way, we crab into the wind. We face this way. So we're actually kind of flying like this. It's a crosswind crab situation, pretty interesting. Uh, and we don't pre-program that in this aircraft. Uh, we we pre-program the dynamics, the governing equations of motion, and then we just make 
the jet obey the dynamics. And that's gonna be different than we do in controls courses and in feedbacks and system dynamics courses. It's gonna be the same um, notions, but we're gonna resequence when we do them. That'll be kind of like the bottom line, what you get out of this is if you remember system dynamics or if you took things in controls, especially feedback controls, we're gonna do lots or all of those steps, but we're not gonna do them in the order that we did uh, when we learned it the first time. And the result comes out to be um, different and bestows robust features like you see here. So currently we are leaving from the DARPA project circa 10 years-ish ago. Uh, we are right now at the Naval School. We're trying to build the same sort of thing, scale model B-52 bombers. Uh, that is what you saw uh, me flying at the opening movie. That's what I did in the Air Force. It is a much more interesting problem. Uh, the F-18 Hornet is a high performance fighter and it's fly-by-wire, computer controlled. The older systems like the, the bombers, the B-52 and the B-1 in particular, definitely not fly-by-wire. Uh, and those of you old enough to remember computer processing chips pre-Pentium, think 286 and 386, that's the computer capabilities of the older systems like the B-52s. So it's just a whole different world trying to do very highfalutin avionics and, and techniques in an older system like that. So these are under construction right now. We're going to try to next step, try to implement all of these things on the older systems to see if they work. Uh, and these are just some videos to show you the two things we're building. Um, the one on the left, I'm going to have to crank down the video uh, audio, I remember. The one on the left is powered by electric ducted fans, basically big propellers in an engine cowling, very light very inexpensive. And the one on the right, you just heard that crazy noise. These are real jet engines on the right, eight of them. This is a much, much heavier aircraft um, scaled model on the right. It takes a lot longer to take off. And when you watch its lumbering takeoff, it really looks like the real B-52 taking off. Same when it comes in for landing, uh, that it is a seemingly under-actuated system. On the left, we see some, what I judge to be pretty fancy flying. Um, you'll, see, you'll notice the jet on the left has a pointed tail. And that gives increased stability. It's from a D model B-52. And on the right, it's more appropriate, like a G or H model. It has a chopped off tail. You'll see a longer landing roll on the B-52 on the right, but also a much more stable platform that doesn't seem to be uh, popping around the wind. So extrapolation of this is now you can see um, we have unfortunately in recent history uh, learned about civilian aircraft being downed, flying way over areas that might have conflict going on on the world and somebody mistakes it for an attacking aircraft, especially at air, uh, airline altitude. They suspect that they're a high a fast flying bomber and they end up shooting down a civilian airline. So when I, what I want you to think about is if we in the next year or two, if we make it work on the jet on the right, big, heavy, lumbering, more like an airliner, uh, then you give an electronic ability that's merely an upgrade to avionics for civilian airliner aircraft uh, to try to autonomously respond to heavy battle damage. And not just battle damage, it could be bird strikes, which is a different phenomenon, not at high altitude. It's usually during takeoff and landing roll, uh, ingest a bird to an engine, a bird strikes the wing, that sort of thing, and damages it, uh, which would be much more like the, uh, the small fighter scenario that we saw earlier. Okay, so we talked about modeling and how important the differential equations were. We're gonna start with a really simple example, and I'll show you one step that's more complicated. Things that move in our world, uh, we obey Newton's law. Uh, there's the funny cartoon there, the apple falls. The law we say is F equals MA, the force, applied is proportional to the acceleration of the mass scaled by the mass. There's a similar thing for rotation as expressed by Euler saying that torque equals J omega dot, meaning they're an applied torque, a force at a moment arm equals to the mass moment of inertia J times the angular acceleration omega dot. Uh, so Chasley's a cool dude who came up and said, hey, wait a minute. If I invoke Newton and invoke Euler together, I have fully described motion, mechanical motion in our universe. 
Uh, Chazzy talks about it as a screw axis, that in a direction, motion regarding that direction is axial motion down the axis, translation, Newton, or rotation about that same axis, which he refers to as a screw axis. So we can think about a screw going into a piece of wood and it's rotating around the axis and it's translating down the axis. Uh, and then Chazzy goes, well, there's one, two, three axes and three dimension motion, three dimensional motion. And we've got translation and rotation, Newton and Euler about each axis. And you add up two, two and two, and you get six equations for six degrees of motion, uh, six dimensional problem. So if we put them together, we see it's a very simple system, uh, second ordered differential equation. Uh, later, we're going to see it gets more complicated, but I want to start here to show you the general way to utilize the method that I'm describing. Uh, later, we'll see that, okay, these are valid expressions of motion, but they're measured <clears throat> in coordinates relative to a non-rotating reference frame we call inertial. When we express it in real physical coordinates, it makes sense to us, those frames are rotating and they introduce cross products into both of these equations that couple all six equations and make them nonlinear. And so that's kind of the bear in the cave that we've poked by seeking to go down this path. Very well known, very well studied, uh, but nonetheless, we'll start with a simplified form to show the methodology. So uh, this is where I poke a little bit at our controls things, the things that we know and love, uh, even though it's gonna sound like I'm poo-pooing them, I'm really not, I'm just gonna describe it. We don't need to do it in the way that we think about it. So I'm gonna challenge you this is a very typical topology depicted here in the upper right, uh, where you have some kind of kinetics being the differential equation, usually some kinematic that tells you, how do I know where I am? Where's the coordinate measurement that introduces um, the rotating reference frame we talked about? There are disturbances, forces and torques. Well, if I'm in that kinematic position, then I have this disturbance acting on, on me in a vector fashion. I have some sort of measurement attempt. Where am I? I can never really know. The best I can do is get a sensor and it has noise in it. So I got a good measurement of where I am and it's noisy. And then we usually do stuff with that. We try to filter it. We add estimators and observers and all kinds of normal things like that. We have actuators that produce the force or torque that moves uh, the mass or the mass moment inertia. And then in here, there's a control calculation. That's kind of what I'm going to pick on a little bit right now. You may or may not often use an autonomous trajectory generation scheme. It's going to end up being mandated by what I described today. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. We normally just give the command, uh, go there now. Uh, and here we'll see maneuvers to 30 degrees rotation angle or 30 um, meters or feet uh, in a certain translational direction. So. Uh, as we would normally do if you were a controls person, uh, and you remember in your system dynamics, there are ways that you can craft the control to measure the error. Oops, I told you to go here. I told you to go to 30, but you went to 28. So we can take that two, that error, and then we can calculate a corrective control based on that. And we normally do it with gains that are proportional to the error, proportional to the derivative of the error, PD, proportional and the integral of the error, the sum of the errors in the limit, uh, and PID is proportional integral derivative, just a common form. And I would say that we very often just start there. There are manual tuning methods called uh, Zeigler nickels that are very, very common in industry, meaning that people start here and you can go out, or the technician not requiring uh, an academic to go out and tune it, a technician can go out and pull some levers and tune these gains in a manner that gets good performance. Uh, a little bit more academically rigorous, there's called a linear quadratic regulator, where you say, I'd rather select the gains that are in my control to optimize some cost function or penalty function. Uh, and then there's some math steps you take and you say, okay, here, these, so this selection of gains actually produces a minimum cost, and the cost could be minimum fuel or minimum time, get there fastest or you could weight them to have, I wanna be this much uh, importance placed on fuel or that much importance placed on time or other cost functions. Uh, that usually takes us down the path that, hey, this is an optimization function. 
and we add mathematical skills to learn about how to do optimization. And then we start to realize that nonlinear optimal control is a really attractive way to go because it is sometimes argued, well, it's kind of like the right answer, meaning you can't mathematically do better than it. You've stated some mathematical criteria and you've solved an optimization problem and it says, do this. Uh, and if you write down the math, you can't do better. Uh, there's some weaknesses in that, uh, in that usually feedback makes it unstable if you're trying to do online optimization. So then we go down a path trying to become predictive, which I'll talk about in a minute. Robust control says, hey, let us make the optimization use the H infinity norm instead of the normal two norm for an optimization problem. And it also adds in structured um, uncertainty. So if you don't know something or you have errors, you can structure the problem that that's built into the problem. Now, these are all related to nonlinear control. And the one I'm gonna talk about mostly today that inspires the method, um, Professor Lorenz at the University of Wisconsin teaches something called physics-based control, where he says, if you know the governing differential equation, use it and use it exactly. So we're gonna take that and combine it with predictive control to, if we're trying to figure out what control, trying to figure out what force should be applied to produce an acceleration, we're never gonna, I'm, I'm gonna urge us not to start with a classical form because we can ask the question, when is MX double dot ever gonna equal this thing on the right? And the answer is it never will. We can just go in, equate the coefficients in front of the derivatives and we go, yeah, that's never gonna equal. It's not supposed to equal, it's basically an approximation. We have a linear control that does a good job um, controlling the second order plan, the second order differential equation. So instead of that, we're gonna come in and say, instead we're gonna assert the dynamics, the first step, assert the dynamics as a feed forward sense. Uh, and this is coming out of Professor Lorenz from Wisconsin. If your governing differential equation is MX double dot, you should start by saying, I'll bet there's a control of the form MX double dot. That sounds like a more righteous place to start. Then if I equate coefficients of derivatives on the left and right, well, that seems kind of like, well, there is a double dot here. Earlier, there wasn't even an X double dot on the side of the equation. So we knew it was never gonna equal. So if instead we start with exactly writing the differential equation as an assert it in a feed forward sense, it's gonna drive a couple things. We're gonna to have to have estimates of the mass and the standard step we're gonna do is just put a hat on it because that we're gonna end up allowing that to be a time varying estimate of the mass. Then we're gonna put a subscript D saying a desired acceleration. So we're gonna to have to prescribe this desired acceleration <clears throat> Second step, we're just going to rewrite the differential equation into a regression form, a y equals ax, that sort of thing. Uh, once we do that, we can have optimal learned estimates of whatever we put under the hat, just using a simple two-norm pseudo-inverse solution for the optimization. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. Assert self-awareness, learn the things that you decided you wanted to learn and allow to be time varying, this exactly parallels the earlier described method, nonlinear adaptive control. But instead of learning with a two norm optimal estimate, you'll simply write an adaption rule. Uh, it's usually of the classical form of PD. Okay, running out of time, I owe you. You need a scheme for trajectory generation. And this was a simple one. Generally, we like, as depicted here, step functions. In our system dynamics courses, in our control courses, you like step function. You like to say, go 30 now. And so bam, you go to 30. But unfortunately, step functions and continuous step up and down in a square function is a very challenging, you might even say impossible, demand of a system. In this case, I'm demanding it to be at minus one, zero, and one at exactly the same time. I often say I'm mathematically demanding teleportation. In this case, I'm at 10 now, and I demand you at the, with passage of no time to be at 30. In this case, I'm at zero, demand 30. So what we're trying to do is say, we want to accept a demand for a step, but we don't want to use the mathematical expression of the step because it has deleterious impacts as well. So what I'm doing is trying to mimic a step with a smooth function that does not induce a transient. It's not discontinuous. And I'm just gonna say, well, 
When we remember ordinary differential equations, we solve those with an exponential. And by Euler's formula, you can express an exponential as a sum of sine and cosines. So it kind of seems like differential equations would, wouldn't mind a sinusoidal demand, demand of a sinusoidal solution. So this is just stepping through uh, good old geometry from high school. I can add phase angles. I can increase or decrease the frequency such that I could create at a commanded time, here it's five seconds, a smooth initiation that follows a smooth sine curve up to the commanded angle over the duration of some maneuver time. In this depiction that I'm pointing here, it's two seconds. And then we see here is I just increase the frequency of the sine curve and in this depiction, you can see, oh, of course, it gets faster. The sine curve oscillates faster so that as you increase the frequency, you can very, very, very closely mimic a step function. But it's smooth and it's not discontinuous. So this is a way to have autonomous trajectory generation that would just accept a step command from somebody, go to 30 now, and would just automatically produce analytical forms of the position, the velocity, and the acceleration. We can use those then in the assertion of self-awareness, I now have a full trajectory of desired trajectories. In this expression now, I've added the cross products. This is Euler's law that we did earlier. The first three terms of what we did earlier. Now I'm adding the cross products. So this is now three equations that are coupled and nonlinear, but we're just going to do what we did before. We're gonna put desired D on the states, put hats on everything else, push them into a regression form, use the two norm pseudo inverse solution to solve for the learning. And that's where we're gonna start, that's it. There's no tuning, there's no manual, there's none of that, it's always this. Desired hat for things we estimate, push into regression form, <clears throat> two norm pseudo inverse solution. So on the left, you'll see what, uh, this is a student paper, two Naval students, Alex Rizzo and Brendan Smoreski. Uh, and they published this last year, I think, uh, 2019, November of 19. And so they are looking at optimal open loop control, uh, PID feedback control uh, that has been optimized with a linear quadratic sense and then DAI. And what you'll see is it's almost impossible to see a difference. All three lines on this left plot are superimposed. If we zoom in down to the milli radian, milli degree, we see that no, actually there are differences and those are zoomed on the right. This one being, open loop optimal control. Yes, it kind of did it exactly, but it didn't, it shot past it and then kind of just flew off because it no longer has an optimal open loop command. The middle plot here on the right, you'll recognize as feedback, it overshoots, it oscillates, it settles like normally we would expect. And then the DAI, when it gets up to the end of the trajectory, um, I would I want to say it sticks it, but it doesn't really. You can see a little bit of overshoot right there. And if we zoom now down into the micro degree, micro radian scale, you can go, okay, it does overshoot some. And I can describe that in a Q and A if somebody wants to, because I'm uh, going long on time and I want to start to wrap it up. Uh, so, so that was what I wanted to present. Uh, we have illustrated on spacecraft and we've experimentally uh, seen it validated on the free floating spacecraft you saw me uh, playing with in the first video um, on underwater vehicles, well, we had in pictures, uh, on underwater vehicles, uh, this is the Phoenix vehicle we see depicted here, and that was the one the demonstration was done on. Um, and then we are right now building the B-52 aircraft to try to do that over the next year or two uh, at the Naval School. So uh, deterministic AI as a, it, it sounds like it, although I don't mean to say it, seems like a replacement for our, our controls courses, but it really isn't. If you go back and look, we're still, what it really is, is adding a lot of rigor to the feed forward element, which we teach, I would say weekly, uh, what feed forward we should do. If you go back to old texts in the 1980s, when I was taught this, there were only two, command feed forward and state feed forward. Uh, and if you decide to peel those back, it's not done. Uh, it's just it. It's just that command and state as opposed to this where we're saying, no, 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 the dynamics are the feed forward. Whatever the dynamics are, the governing differential equation of motion is the feed forward. And this just gives it a structure that how do I implement that in a repeatable fashion? Uh, so it will probably come up, what do I deal with disturbances? So I'll pre-answer that one and then I'll close. 
when we have disturbances, it's going to generate errors pushing us off of these trajectories. What I'm going to say is most disturbances have a known form. In the case of um, the underwater vehicles, we know underwater dynamics. We know how the flow of uh, the water and the wave motion and all that sort of thing. We can write an equation that's analytic. In the case of spacecraft, I'm going to say, let's imagine this is an aerodynamic disturbance or a gravity gradient disturbance. We know those equations. They're well known you know, for a long time. So what you do is you assert them too. So right here in the first statement, instead of just doing this dynamic, you add the other equations as part of your dynamic as well. So you just end up getting a larger bunch of coefficients in your regression form here, your desired matrix of knowns and your vector of unknowns. But everything else is the same. So the disturbance also get rejected, but now you're able to also learn things about the disturbance. So if you're flying, skimming the atmosphere, but the atmosphere is changing in a spacecraft sense, uh, the density is changing, for example, that's something that belongs in the vector of unknowns. And those would be things that you the system would be learning as you change flight regimes. Okay, let me uh, close that down. Hopefully that's just kind of keyed up one thing that I think you'd want to ask, but I'd like to open up the floor to uh, questions. Yeah, let's start off actually by, by thanking our, our, our speaker the best that we can on a, on a Zoom meeting. So th thank you very much uh, for, 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 your, for your talk there. I always find you know, these topics really interesting. Uh, yeah, with that, we'd like to open it to, uh, to questions. There is a, uh, a participant window there is one way to, to raise your hands. We can, we can use that uh, as a way to uh, say that you'd like to ask a question. Or if you don't have uh, audio capabilities, you can always type something into the chat uh, as well. I am opening up my participants window. David, thank you. I appreciate you emceeing it. I think I have too many things open to do this well, so I really appreciate it. No worries. We appreciate your talk. I went back to this slide because I kind of thought somebody's going to ask, like, wait a minute, global temperatures, that's bull. Uh, but I'll leave it open just in case. Um, maybe I'll throw something out there. I'm um, just um, thank you very much. That was that was really cool. I love the uh, the videos of the the planes losing part of their wings and still being able to manage. I thought that was super impressive. Um, there's there's a bunch of different uh, uh, pieces of information those aircraft have to maintain about their their um, their physical properties, their mass, the orientation of parts that they've lost, and so forth, to be able to manage that control. I presume at some point there's a set of there's a sort of set of parameters that they're tracking, like their mass and other things, that doesn't match what's in reality, and yet maybe they're still able to control the flight. And I'm curious. I'm, sorry, it's not a very crisp question, but is is how do you figure out which of those parameters to track so that in many situations you will be able to regain control? Okay, I think I understood the question. I'll restate it and fumble around and then you and I can have a discussion to get me on the right track. Um, so the question really was like, how do I make the selection of what to track? And what I was hearing him say is in that first step, how do I pick what do I wanna learn and what do I wanna state is the learning goes in the vector of unknowns in the regression form, but we're gonna say something's a matrix of knowns and that those shouldn't be changing. Uh, and how do I, make the selection of those. Is that a decent rephrasing of the question? That's a beautiful rephrasing, thank you. Okay, uh, so I've asserted in these first couple instances um, that I'm choosing the motion states as the thing to be known. And that's also counter. We don't, normally if we do controls or system dynamics, the motion states are usually the, the thing that we're trying to solve for because in where's the topology? When we do the topology and we go around the Christmas tree, then where's my topology? Here we go. So as we go around, can everyone still see me sharing? I can see it. Okay, good. So as we go around this topology, I talked about, but skipped over really quickly. We usually down here are trying to deal with 
where the hell am I? Because we can't know, it's not possible to know. The best we can do is have a sensor that senses a physical phenomenon, a temperature, making something move in a gradient, and then we gonculate that into, oh, therefore I'm here. Um, GPS signals, uh, triangulation basically. Uh, so we never really know where we are. The best we have is a measurement of that and it comes with noise. Then in the estimators, we normally have state estimators. Uh, think Kalman filtering, extended Kalman filtering, unscented Kalman filtering, particle filter, all that. Because of all of those needs, it, it puts, and I'm saying we, because I mean it for me too, it puts us in the paradigm that no, 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 motion states go in the vector of unknowns because that's where we, that's where we put them so that we can do things like Kalman filtering on it. But here we're just gonna reverse it as an initial assertion, which is not very well founded other than I'm gonna say, I think I have buku tons of places that I can get motion about where I am. I'm gonna have some sensors. It's been work very well studied. What if I have one sensor for position or velocity or acceleration, but not the others? Uh, and then we can do reduced order observer models to get all of the others. So I just have so much confidence in this feedback channel to determine where I am. Um, and we can even estimate jerk, the next derivative beyond acceleration, well-known process. So I thought between sensors and observers and Kalman filters and all that, there's just so many ways that I can say, dude, I'm fine. I, I think I have a pretty good handle on where I am. What's the mass of my aircraft right now? And when I was flying around, we had little measurement devices trying to help us guess what the mass of the jet was. It was never right. It was a good guess. Because if we drop 70,000 pounds of bombs like that, the entire CG of the aircraft is dramatically changed and we might fly out of control and all die. So it was a really big deal. Just trying to figure out in the B-52, what, what the hell's the mass? When, where is the location of the center of the mass? And so it's with that motivation that, man, I had lots and lots and lots of places I could go and look at my position, my velocity, my acceleration. It was little to nothing was telling me what's the mass of my bomber and our lives were on the line. And so I have tended to try to put all the motion states as something that I say, I'm going to know. And I put them in the vector, I'm sorry, the matrix of knowns in the regression form. And everything else, I try to do the parameterization that we see here to try to get it in the regression form so that stuff fits into the vector. And then I go, oh, okay, I guess, look, I can learn my, uh, the position of my magnetic dipole because in the equation for the magnetic torque, I'm gonna take the positions to be known or prescribed by that uh, trajectory generation scheme and put them in the matrix. And then what's left in the vector turns out to be things like the magnetic dipole, uh, the coefficient of drag which is absolutely a varying thing. Tons of research about as we flew through different regimes of the atmosphere, how the density changed, how the coefficient of drag changed. So those things de facto end up in the vector. So it's not the best answer. Like I was inspired to put them there, uh, but it really comes out of the, not the heritage and nonlinear adaptive control. Well, that's what they did too, is they did adaptive methods to try to find out what's the coefficient of drag, what's the atmospheric density, What's the mass? What's the mass moment of inertia? What's the position of the CG? In particular, where is the, the paper that I showed at the beginning, that that was a key thing. This was just a six degree of freedom um, submarine. You might as well say it's an aircraft or spacecraft. It's a thing of mass and mass moment of inertia. It's all the same governing equations, but instead of aerodynamic drag, I have hydrodynamic forces. So we write out all those equations as well. And it turned out the key Stickler part that took me a little bit of research and reading other people and copying everyone else in the best American fashion of research was decoupling the six equations because the position of the center of gravity is multiplied by the mass and mass moment of inertia in the equations. And those are the things I wanted to learn, but they were in a multiplicative pair. So I, that was a tricky one. How do I split that to get them into the vector of the unknowns when they're multiplied nonlinear, nonlinearly? So I guess, um, not saying that there's a lot of um, novel thinking in the selection of the other ones. It was just confessing, I put the motion states or anything I thought I knew in the matrix and well, what was left over ended up in the vector. 
but in that case, it, it did take me a little bit of, of thinking and research to get onto how do I decouple the multiplied nonlinearly combined things that I wanted to put in a linear fashion in the vector. So that took a little bit of doing. Did that answer the question or did I, did I digress and dance around it too much? I know, thank you, that helps. So um, you're, you're observing motion and some other properties of the, the, the vehicle, and then you're inferring these uh, parameters that are sort of driving how the thing will respond to the forces that you, uh, you propel it with. So that helped a lot, thank you. I think you got it right on. And the words you used were perfect was uh, that's really what's going to happen. I don't know the equations precisely because I don't know the mass really. The best I could do is, well, when the contractor built it, this was the mass and the measurements of it. Uh, but the world's going to happen in accordance with those equations. So we're trying to design everything around the equations uh, rather than the other way. So the list you see on the slide here, normally we would say, well, I know the world's coupled nonlinear is going to do that, but darn it, can it do this instead? And so we try to have something that makes it behave in the manner that we prefer it to behave. And that takes us down feedback control. It takes us down, even in the um, adaptive and predictive things, we have things like model reference con control, model following. And the point there is, I, I don't like the, what's going to happen in the real world. Can't, how do, what do I write the equations to make it behave this other way that I want to? And in that regard, we're, we're throwing that all out the window. The first step of here is just saying, it's going to behave these equations, just as you've said. Uh, so how do I formulate it then to use that fact against itself, I guess? Thank you. Great, it looks like um, uh, Mason Peck has his uh, hand raised there. Well, oh, Mason. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tim, uh, and thanks, David. Uh, so fascinating talk, and I wonder, wonder if you can zoom out a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the acquisition or policy implications, because uh, I expect you to agree that um, any, uh, any kind of, we'll call it new and sporty approach to autonomy, which I guess I would count this as, um, is going to receive some resistance on the part of the folks who ultimately need to see this as a, a part of a successful deployed system. Right, so uh, how does that kind of cultural environment, which is, you know, historically has been resistant even to things like um, MIMO control and uh, adaptive control, which are fairly traditional in the context of machine learning approaches, um, you know, how, how would that uh, environment respond to this? And so going forward, how would you uh, approach the system during this to make that successful for those users? Sure. Um... Uh, I, I understood the question. I'll rephrase it a little uh, in case my answer misses the mark, uh, because what I'm going to do, what you were saying is, how would I? And I don't know that I can answer how would I, because it uh, requires too much uh, omnipotence on my part to control things outside my, uh, my experience. What I'm going to do is tell you what I have experience with, the approaches that have been taken and the approaches that, uh, that I would recommend we continue taking. So we are talking about learning, and this slide reflects adaption coming to learning as kind of the next transition in that we are now getting more and more comfortable with adaptive control. If you go back, um, thank goodness, it must be 40 or more years, we were starting to tinker with adaptive control already back then. Uh, the space shuttle had an adaptive control, uh, type of adaptive control where we were doing lookups. And I think Mason probably gonna speak to that much more stronger than I am since I'm a defense guy and he's a NASA guy. But so we have a deep history of learning with adapting, parameterizing the problems so that uh, as opposed to learning, we just say, apply an adaption to that coefficient of drag or, or whatever manner uh, you wanted to instantiate adaption. Uh, so, and that is, by the way, the DARPA slide I'm showing you right now was still the methods being used. Uh, the novelty in this wasn't really as much adaptive control. We've been doing that for a while it was the very fast way of linearizing the system equations that permitted the linear adaption methods. So that was the circa 19, 19, 19, 2010, when we were doing this DARPA project. So in answer to your question is I'm, I'm expressing that my experience with things like this is through DARPA, uh, which has a very, very, very low transition rate, meaning uh, if we invented the internet in DARPA, it transitioned, we have the internet. The ARPANET is now the internet. Uh, but there are many, many, many things that DARPA do, DARPA does, 
over a 36 month program and a 36 month duration that may never transition to be an operational system. And I'll explain that. Uh, when I got to DARPA, I had my ID card and on it is the pre-fired date. And everyone there is that way. It is the way that you keep that organization hungry is that nobody's there for 50 years as a DARPA person. Is you go with your pre-fired date and if you're hired on as a PM, you generally have 36 months, three years. I went on an even shorter ticket under a fellowship. Um, so each PM is trying to do a program, in this case, the uh, damage tolerant F-18s. He's trying to do the program or she's trying to do the program and do it well enough that it catches somebody's attention in the general research infrastructure. I almost said labs, uh, ONR, AFRL, uh, I'm sorry, um, NRL, but I really mean even AFOSR, ONR, the, the, uh, the husbanding agencies that decide what we're going to do next year. And those operate, Mason will probably know, on the program objective memorandum, a three-year earlier budget process where we need to declare today what we're going to invest our money in three years from now. And then the federal government will align that budget for us. So this is the manner that these decisions are made. Uh, so DARPA does something really crazy cool, and we are trying to show it and pitch it to a couple audiences, one being a, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and ONR, the Office of Naval Research that funded the, uh, the U, uh, underwater vehicle thing I showed, uh, but also the labs themselves. If the ONR and AFOSR aren't going to accept it yet, they're still not ready, then you want the labs and the two military schools, AFID and NPS, you want them involved. And in 2010, as I was leaving DARPA, we were making arrangements to give me this hardware out in Monterey. I was gonna take these F-18s from Rockwell Collins and we were gonna put them on our airfields out in Monterey. We were gonna continue, just kind of keep it alive. Uh, the hope would, and we're in a triage now, neither the Navy or the Air Force bought it, wants to transition it in the next three years. And they have out years as well, really a five year, uh, programming cycle. So in the five to 10 year defense programs, they're not interested. So then it goes into the labs, it goes into the universities, which of course we love because we have things like this um, that are coming straight from something DARPA may have, I wanna say invented, but it really is that DARPA just validated as useful uh, and discovered some new things about. And then we as faculty and students have the opportunity to accept this equipment. Um, and then I'll, I'll give a caveat, why, why aren't we doing it now just to, fully answer um, Mason's question on the fact that it often doesn't transition. When it came time to transition this equipment in Rockwell Collins from the places in their spaces that it was, package it up, put it on the loading dock, I, I was paying for all of that and then transitioning it from Rock Rockwell Collins out to Monterey, the contract expired, meaning it was done, the contract was done yeah, like a month before. And so it comes out to be, Hey, we'd love to, but it, you know we can't without a contract. So now we have to keep all the equipment. So we have to keep all the equipment because we don't have a contractual mechanism that legally permits me, Rockwell Collins, to take money and, and hand the equipment over. Even though it's government furnished equipment, it doesn't personally belong to Rockwell Collins. Uh, they have stakes in it, but it's GFE, government furnished equipment. Uh, I couldn't accept it without a contract. And of course, I later learned uh, they were the same thing, trying to keep it alive. In 2011, they got a re-up of this contract with a different agency uh, and they continued the research as well. So that's kind of how these things happen as we're trying to transition something new and cool. When the folks who are not yet comfortable aren't willing to buy into it yet, we just push it down into the labs and into the universities and we try to continue, I don't wanna say proselytizing, because that's not really right. That acts like everything's already done and it should have been um, transitioned. And that's not true. There are things about this system even that, yeah, we still wanna look at. And that's, that's the righteous um, field for AFRL, Naval Research Laboratory, the universities. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to why it often doesn't happen. I think that was implied in Mason's questions like this was 2010, how come we just aren't doing this now? Darn it. Uh, I forgot to mention at the very beginning in that 4050s time, there was a loss of life. When we tried to do this on aircraft, adaptive control, uh, there was, um, I, I don't say a malfunction, but there was a expression of our lack of understanding of some of the things. 
uh, the aircraft crashed and the, the pilot was killed. And so that was a reason to say, we're not ready yet. And since we've been gun shy to believing scientists, academics, uh, and engineers come up and say, no, it's ready now, trust me. So the system is very um, reluctant to do it because we have a track record now of having lost life. Um, so I suppose that's an, an ugly answer, but it's the best one I got, Mason. Does that answer your question satisfactorily? I think so. And my question is just coming from a place where you know, I've tried over the years since I'm going to say the early 90s to implement some of what I would take to be cutting edge controls on, um, on, let's say, defense intelligence systems. And the answer is always about a generation behind, you know? <laughs> so I, I think it's partly the acquisition process is um, naturally conservative, but then also the people involved in that uh, have a certain domain knowledge that stems from their own background, which probably was formed even 20 years before the, you know, the inception of the program. So I just, you know, that, I think it's important to pursue these cutting edge techniques and they are the future in my opinion. Um, at the same time, there's a, there's an acculturation issue that's going to uh, follow them. And uh, thanks for your insights. Great question, Mason. I appreciate your uh, response to my response. I think it's right on. Do we have any other questions for our speaker? Well, we're getting close to the end of the time. Uh, I still welcome additional uh, questions here, but I'll, I'll ask a, uh, a question if that's all right. The um, uh, Noting that there are a number of students who watch our, our, uh, our seminar here, I was hoping you could uh, first speak to, you know, uh, although this example uh, has to do with vehicles, how the uh, idea could be applied to other different realms uh, as well. And then uh, perhaps you could uh, shamelessly plug both your course and any projects that students could, could be a part of. So if they want to learn more about, about how to, uh, uh, about what you've been talking about here. As that long sounds as you're great. That's, uh, I'll offer sale of t-shirts too. <laughs> sounds great. I kind of thought this was a, court, uh, a question that probably should come up uh, saying, yeah, you're flying jets and rockets and submarines and all that kind of thing. But I've claimed to have done this on things like circuits, uh, electrical vehicle sales, global average temperatures. If we go back to what the method was itself, sorry, that's just a cool movie. The crux of the method was assert whatever governing differential equation of motion you have in this fashion with two norm optimal learning. And, and that's kind of it. You have to do some steps in the beginning to get this parameterization to cram it into the regression form. But then it's, we're not, um, we're not tuning. We're not doing things like we've done with other control systems. So the question that I'm going to re I'm rephrasing the question into what I think it really is. Hey, Toolman, what the hell, what's the, What's the governing differential equation of motion for circuits? That one's kind of a, a fake question because we do know, yeah, yeah, there are electrodynamics. Those equations are known. So it's really easy, even though I haven't shown it, for you to make the fee, uh, leap of faith to say, whatever, dude, there's an equation out there that governs circuits. Maybe Kirchhoff's involved in it. Uh, and we, it's well known. And I could assert those and you'd see how it is. What about vehicle sales and global temperatures? That one's tougher. And there's a field of study I haven't mentioned yet where we at, try to address that question. The stock market, what equation governs the stock market? That's crazy. It's a silly, seemingly silly question to ask. Yet everybody on Wall Street that's giving investment advice has projections. And they want to be closer to the stock market so that the data reaches their computers a microsecond faster than their competitors because they're doing a, a system identification online that takes in the new data and says modeling, just like hurricane modeling, weather modeling. Yeah, we're really great at that. But the point is we all do a thing called system identification saying, what are the system models? What are the math equations? What are the governing equations that, that direct this system that would produce this kind of data? Because normally we just get data in and we're trying to figure out what system um, drove that data. So there's an extra step when it's an unknown process or unregulated process by a physical law, Newton's law, Euler's law, Kirchhoff's equations, uh, vehicle sales data, global temperature data, stock market data, those it requires a separate step that's not been presented in this presentation of system ID. And the point being, I need equations. Then once I've got the equations 
they will have some degree of accuracy to them, then I will assert them as the slide I'm showing now. Well, I have to do an additional step to find out what is the true governing equation. And each person in the stock market example, uh, each investment banker would have their own secret sauce, their own secret way of trying to get the equation that most accurately represents all the stock data so that they can make a prediction about what's gonna to happen tomorrow using those system equations. Uh, so that's kind of the lifting up the hood, how on earth, and that's very standard. I think we, we do that anyway, use system ID to find the equations. And there's a fancy speak term. We assert those equations with a thing called certainty equivalence principle. <laughs> uh, basically we're certain that it's equivalent, that these, these are the right equations for the, that govern the system. And we do that in that preliminary stage of system ID where we've done a proof that says, no, look, it meets an optimization criteria. I can't get a better set of system equations of this form, so here. And then there are other people who go, what if I use this other form and they're trying to get a better system equation? Uh, and then after that step for these systems that I've done so far, electrical vehicle sales and uh, global average temperatures, you assert certain the equivalence. It says, I'm asserting that these are good equations. Uh, and then everything afterward follows. Great question. Well, thank you. And uh, again, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, plug your course as well for uh, those who might want to want to learn more. Okay. As well as any, um, or any projects that you have that students could possibly be, be a part of in the future. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple at the end, just cool slides. My course um, that I'll offer every year for systems engineering students is crosslist with MAE. Um, it is 5280 and 6280, Adaptive and Learning Systems. And it's basically what you've just seen, where I'm going to show you the adaptive way that was not displayed here. And at the end of the last month of the course, we're going to do the learning way. So we'll set it up in the first course is stuff you know, system dynamics, what are poles, what are zeros, what are characteristic equations, controls people will be really um, safe in that initial material. But then we leave that behind in the middle of the course, we enter the kind of thing that we're doing now where we're trying to make it adaptive. And at the end of the course, because of its simplicity, let me go back to the slide, this slide's it. That's kind of like the last month of the course is assert the equation of motion and learn. So each student is then free to say, well, dude, this is kind of easy. I already get this. But they have created over the course a classical answer from your system dynamics course or your controls course, and they are lines on a plot. Then you've created a nonlinear adaptive version and it is better or worse creating another line in a plot. And you have a growing table of data now, figures of merit saying, perhaps your nonlinear adaptive was 2% better or worse than your others. Um, I'm gonna have to pause for five seconds. The gardeners are outside. It's okay, the fun of working at home, we're, we're all, all dealing with it. Sorry, it's starting to get real noisy here. Sorry about that. Uh, so then at the end of the course, the last month, we're basically just doing this slide and you can add as many equations that are known into this regression form and I haven't done them all. So if you're, if I allow folks to go down the circuit example at the very beginning of the slide. Uh, this month, you'll see published in Applied Sciences, the forced Vanderpool circuit uh, should be out in about two weeks. And I'm showing how doing this to that circuit makes the computer systems resilient to EMP. Uh, I'm having a very large EMP event akin of being in a, a lightning strike or in the vicinity of nuclear blasts, that sort of stuff. I'm showing how this method um, makes you robust and, and don't fry your system sort of thing. So as we track down the course, it will fork and you won't all be working on the same thing. You can choose, I'll give you tracks. You can try uh, circuits, you can try spacecraft, aircraft, underwater vehicles, and then there's a dealer's choice. There's a, there's a textbook that I'll use and I'll show you. And you can say, dude, I don't like any of those options. Can't I try blah, 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 blah. My answer is absolutely yes. I want something in the course to resonate with you. And I will go down that path with you uh, and guide you along the way. So that is uh, 5280 and 6280 Adaptive and Learning Systems. It's a course, if you had to sum it up, it's modeling and estimation poised for learning or adaption. Of course, an estimation requires modeling up front. 
uh, and then we use the estimation and modeling to do adaption or learn. So that's my course, uh, t-shirts to be available soon. Sorry, just being a little uh, funny there. Let me go back to the end. I did do some just other cool stuff. Um, a, a big passion of mine uh, is to bring Cornell Systems Engineering and the Sibley School, where I'm, I'm a point at both, closer to the military schools because they have really cool things. So you, you heard that I was almost, well, I was able to obtain all those F-18s, but I ended up not being able to transition the equipment to take ownership of them. Um, on the left, you'll see a fleet SATCOM satellite. Everything is on it except for the solar arrays that attach here and this cold gas thruster we took off for safety reasons. It's got LEDs that blink, but otherwise this is a fully functioning military communication satellite that is in orbit right now, a handful of them. This is the qualification model. The military in the old days, we had to qualify the entire design. So this spacecraft has been shaked and baked and put through tough qualifying tests that if we could avoid it, we'd like to not launch it. And so after the constellation is fully populated, the military says, I do not have a requirement operationally for this asset anymore. We can raise our hand and go, oh, dude, I'll take it. I have a requirement for education for research. So it sits in a clean room at, in Monterey and we use it for education and for research. Uh, on the right, you'll look, look at something that kind of looks like James Webb. Uh, this is a scaled model of segmented mirror telescopes akin James Webb. Uh, again, a sunsetting military program that says we are now done with this asset. We don't have a requirement for it anymore because we're operational, but it has scientific value. It, it belongs to the government, uh, which somebody, if we gave it to you for free, would somebody give it good care and feeding? As you see depicted on the slide, would you build a nice clean room, keep it clean, operate it, and use it? These are students climbing on it, not faculty. Uh, so would, would you make your students get on this hardware and develop new things with experimental validation uh, in the labs? So that is something I would plug is I, I'm kind of new at Cornell, one year in now, not even quite one year in, second semester. Uh, this is where I'm going. So everything that I think I can touch to combine uh, us with the Air Force and the Navy schools, I will seek to do that uh, in a COVID environment. We are now formulating distance access into these labs. And that really works to my favor that I should be able to do things uh, in Ithaca and in Monterey simultaneously that we can both uh, benefit from that. Um, so don't be surprised if you say, if you're in my 5280 class and you want to go validate something on a spacecraft that you did in my class, don't be surprised if I urge you to go down an MEng project or a thesis or dissertation path where we would try to experimentally validate it on experimental hardware. Those two I just showed you, but you might remember this free floating spacecraft simulator. There's probably four of these spread around campus. This just happened to be the one that I worked on when I was a student. Uh, so yeah, this is my goal. So let, know that I don't fence off research and teaching very strongly at all. I really mix them and you've probably picked up on that in the 5286-2280 class that when you get to the end, there's not a fixed final exam. There isn't a final exam or a midterm. We're developing things that are known, but at the end, I actually leave it open-ended to give students room to go, oh, dude, this sounds cool. And then we go down that path. I uh, have no fear. I've been teaching now for uh, uh, almost 11 years. Uh, I can manage that that it's not everyone has the same final and here's your rubric and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's very strictly graduate. I don't think I could do this very well to an undergraduate audience and have my courses turn out as well. Uh, I'm learning because I, I don't have experience teaching undergraduates. I've for a decade taught graduate students only, but just because I keyed you up and showed you the singularity strike, I wanna show you what happens when you get it right. You can see on the right, I'm kind of chilling now. I'm relaxed <laughs> over sit, chilling it over here. So we're doing the same maneuver, but because we, we ended up striking singularities that we didn't really think were supposed to be there. 
uh, the issue was that we really didn't have our math, math models right. And the toughest part was what was the ma mass and mass moment of inertia of the test bed? we had done a bunch of experiments to find it, but dude, it wasn't right. It was as close as we could get. And so as we were doing things that were flying at or near singular conditions, we ended up striking them and going to them anyway, making us go develop other methods that I don't want to discuss aren't really part of this discussion, but is the motivation to me that I give us, I give myself two credit for knowing things about systems that I probably shouldn't, motivating the structure for, hey, let's make those things be time varying. Um, this is the gyro that we were looking at. My next thing is I have two of these and depicted on the lower left, um, four de degrees of freedom gyros. The thing that was going singular earlier were these gyros. Here's one, two, three of them because you need three for three axis control. What I'm trying to do now is say one gyro having four degrees of freedom, um, having three rotational degrees of freedom and one being varying the speed of the wheel. So that now you have a three degree problem, but you have four degrees of action you can take. So with this device, uh, we will try to, with a single device, maintain three axis control and use that fourth degree of freedom to do stuff about singularities. And that's pretty common. You get a fourth degree of freedom and you go write optimization equations or whatever it is the student, the faculty want to try to do uh, to see how that works. And so I just last year um, purchased two of these uh, and made them Ford off. So uh, they're in the labs in Monterey. And these are also, here's a video of them just, it's just cool videos of, and you'll laugh, it's, it's sitting in a kitchen. <laughs> it's in the kitchen operating uh, the, the lab of COVID. So these are things also that I would be trying to get electronic access to that um, it wouldn't be, the course I taught last fall, this is a very good fit for. Uh, so in, I think every other year, maybe the following year, 2023-ish, I would be wanting to have this well-established as part of that course that in the course students could analyze something, theorize something should happen, and then uh, through an online interface, go in and run an experiment to see, compare their predictions and simulations with experimental results. Uh, and again, I would make this just part of a course as opposed to research. And I would, I'm, I'm hoping that ignites a passion in some student that they did this cool little nugget, this small part of the problem, very cool in the class, and it, and it grips them and then and then they end up trying to pursue it because they it clicks with them and they, they it's not hard. They don't see it as a challenging problem. That's probably all I've got for you. Yeah, black black slide. Well, no, I appreciate it. Uh, we're obviously a, a bit over, over now, but as we didn't have to give up the room, uh, I figured those who could could stay and wanted to stay would would be uh, would all be welcome to. But again, we we thank you very much uh, for your time and your talk, and um, I'm sure you probably have earned a couple of more takers for for your course as well. So thank all right, you all. I love that, but I, it's some good vibes. I hope that's true. <laughs> well, again, uh, thank you all very, very much. And uh, yes, make sure you, you check out our, our next uh, uh, event for part of the Ezra Seminar Series. Thank you all.